Good morning. I, I love that intro, man. That thing's kind of, I like it. Um, so it's been a great week, a lot of good stuff. One of the things I got to do this week um, was meetings. And I know that some people, they, oh, meetings. No, I'm like, yeah, it was good. It's good. A lot of good meetings uh, with the network, with other pastors, just with the team. And just, we've spent some time this past week just kind of looking at where we've been, what we're doing, and what our plans are. And so that kind of leads us, and the reason that was very encouraging is because next week, now I know you've heard the announcement, but I kind of want to share a little bit too. Next week uh, will be a vision service. Now, if you've been coming here for a while, you know that what we do is we take books of the Bible and we go chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and we go through those, and that's how we teach. So last week we did Revelation chapter 2, this week will be Revelation chapter 3, and that's the standard pattern. We like to do expository teaching in that way, um, and so because we believe it's one of the best ways to really understand, to keep things in context, and, and to grow quicker in, in our understanding of God's Word. But next week, we're, we're going to veer from that, and we're going to be talking about the vision and the mission of the church. And so the reason I wanted to share a little bit about that is because sometimes people would say, oh, well, that's not what I'm used to is something different. It is something different. And the reason that it's important for us to be here um, is because that it's about us. It's about how God is using us, uh, you, me, the church, in the community, and also in the, in the church itself. And, it, you know, in that service, we'll talk about where the money has come from, where the money, money's been going, but we'll also talk about how are we serving the community? What are the opportunities in front of us? And so it's about growing as a church. My first service that I ever attended at the Experience Community Church was the first Sunday in 2018. And my wife and I attended a vision service. So we didn't know it was going to be a vision service. And to be honest, I, I, I was, we were invited to go. And I'm not going to, well, I'll go ahead and say, I wasn't really excited because I could tell from the name it was probably not a great church. Um, <clears throat> so we went to a vision service. We heard the things I just shared. And, and really, we walked away from that. It's like, wow, this church looks really good on paper. You know, they do a lot of good things, and it's in line with what we know the church should be. And so it looked really good on paper, but it did cause us to want to come back because one thing we want to find out, well, okay, you can look good on paper, but how's the teaching? Where's the theology? And so we were exposed to expository teaching that was not political. It wasn't agenda-driven. It was driven by God's Word and an understanding of His Word so that we can go grow in a relationship with Him. It's what I needed. It's what we all need. And so, you know, here we are. That was 2018. And look, and it has brought me to this place. So I'm saying this, come to the vision service next week. You could be a campus pastor in just a few years. <laughs> so, you know, I'm just throwing it out there. I mean, that's the way it worked for me. I don't know if it may work like that for others. I, I do want to encourage you to be here next week um, because it's a lot about us. It's about what we're doing and about how we're, we're working and impacting the community. So, but we are going to be back in chapter three this week. Uh, so again, if, if you've been here, you know, we, we go through chapter by chapter. So Revelation, we started a little different. We started with an introduction and just kind of set a, a feel for what we might do in this book, because um, there are probably a lot of expectations, a lot of curiosity when it comes to teaching Revelation. So we, we looked at the introduction, we talked about it, and then we did chapter one. Last week, Grant did a great job with chapter two. And last week, as he talked about that, uh, he was saying that through Jesus, the church conquers. Now, what we looked at was the first four churches in these two chapters. There's seven churches mentioned. And so the first four, and he shared with us, and he was talking about how we conquer. But ultimately, what we got last week, if you were here, you gathered it up, that we get Jesus. And we're going to see that again this week. Good, bad, ugly, however the church is, Jesus is still for us, with us, and we can conquer with him. 
We're going to see that again this week. We saw it last week. Now, if you want to, you can follow along. You Maybe you got one of the handouts. A lot of what I say will be on the screen. If you download the app, that's another great way to follow along. would encourage you to do that. Uh, or maybe you just want to sit and listen and think, uh, whatever. I'm not judging you if I don't see you with something in your hands um, because I'm going to be teaching from this book. So that's what we're going to do. Today, as we get into chapter 3, um, some tough questions that we're going to ask when we get to the end, but kind of this overreaching question that we'll ask ourselves is what stops us from being honest about who and what we are? So maybe you were here last week and you got a little taste of the, f- the first four churches and you picked Smyrna. Uh, okay, yeah, I'm Smyrna. And this week we may look at these three churches and say, well, no, turns out I'm Philadelphia. Okay, we're gonna find that maybe it doesn't work this way. We don't get to cherry pick. Um, that maybe we don't get to say, we're those two good ones. Because the reality is that as a church or even as individuals, we can find ourselves in all seven of these churches. There's something here we need to see. Will God speak? Will God speak? So before we get into chapter three, let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you that it is right here in front of us. Thank you that we can read it. We can talk about it and we will this morning. But Father, most of all, we pray that you'll speak. Speak to us, please. Father, we pray for the other campuses of the Experience Community Church that right now are looking at this very same passage. We pray, God, please speak to your church. And in that, I mean this, Father, that down the road from right here, there are plenty of good churches in this community that proclaim the name of Jesus Christ and they're looking at your word. And another passage in our prayer right now, Father, is that you would speak in those churches. Father, speak to your church in Tullahoma, in Coffee County, in Tennessee. Speak to your church, Father. We believe you. In Christ's name, amen. So let's look at this first church, Sardis. Okay, let me share with real quick about Sardis before we go there. So if you haven't read ahead, spoiler alert, Sardis is not such a great church, okay? And I remember many years ago when I was a youth pastor and I was teaching the book of Revelation and we studied this book and we were teaching about Sardis. And I literally said, you know, Sardis is is not one of those churches we want to identify with. That's like you might see a church called Smyrna, right? Or you may even see one called the Church of Philadelphia. Someone will call it, you know, Smyrna Baptist Church, you know, Philadelphia, you're never going to see Sardis Baptist Church. I mean, because no one wants to identify with it. And I make it very clear that Sardis is like one of the least favorite ones here. They mess some stuff up. We're going to talk about that. So I made this big statement. Lo and behold, it was just a few months later. We were on our way out to East Tennessee, Gallenberg, Pigeon Forge area, going to a youth retreat. And this van comes up and passes us. And there it says it right there, Sardis Baptist Church right on the side of it. And don't you know that every one of my teenagers saw it and they're like, hey, Brother Joe. And I'm like, hey, they're speeding. Did you notice (laughs) they passed us? I mean, I told you about Sardis, right? Because sinners. And (laughs) turns out there's a city in Alabama called Sardis. And well, I don't know what, they didn't have anything else to name their church, I guess. Somebody needs to write them a letter about that. But anyway, well, it looks that turns out Jesus wrote them a letter right here. Let's read it. Write to the angel of the church in Sardis. Thus says the one who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Be alert and strengthen what remains, which is about to die. For I have not found your works complete before my God. Remember then what you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you're not alert, I will come like a thief. And you have no idea what hour I will come upon you. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not defiled their clothes and they will walk with me in white because they are worthy. In the same way, the one who conquers will be dressed in white clothes and I will never erase his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my father and angels and before the angels. Let everyone who has ears to hear, listen to what the spirit says to the churches. So let's look at this church. Now, a few things here that we really have already kind of settled. 
But Jesus reminds Sardis that he is the one who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Now, we, we, we've kind of clarified this already, that the seven spirits are the attributes or the character of the Holy Spirit. So we see that there, and we, we, we justify that with Isaiah 11, where it's literally spelled out seven different attributes or characteristics of the Holy Spirit. And so we know that. And the seven stars are the churches. Uh, another little bonus here for those of you that might be into the numbers things, um, but seven also represents perfection. So when we also see the, these, uh, these seven spirits, it's not seven different spirits. It's the one perfect Holy Spirit of God. That's what we see here, okay? We, we talked about that already. I just wanted to... Now, well, it was in here again, so we had to say it again. So there it is. So this church at Sardis, it just doesn't receive approval. Uh, he gets right into the criticism of Sardis because he just doesn't see anything good in them. The, the main accusation that he has against them is their, their reputation is faulty. They fool everyone into thinking that they're alive, but they're not. They're spiritually dead. Really, this is a church full of nominal Christians. And some may make the argument that it was a church full of folks that were acting like believers. Um, I'm willing to give a little grace here and say that they just weren't living like believers. So uh, there is serious problems in the church in Sardis, and Jesus has serious problems with them. Now, he makes them some, uh, he gives them a little bit of advice here, and he says, hey, you need to be alert strengthen what little passion you have left. It's, it's time to straighten up. I've not found your works complete. So it turns out maybe they had done a little something. Maybe they had uh, followed Christ at first, but they somehow become complacent and they've just not done what they're supposed to do. And he says, repent. So this is a huge stumbling block, a really, a really scary enemy of the church, and that is apathy and entitlement. We become very uh, self-centered. We become very, well, less than cautious. We become very careless, and we forget that God has sent us here for a reason. We forget that we're supposed to be growing. We need to rake, wake up and realize that there's a lot of work to be done. We need to, to remind ourselves of that. Maybe if we took a service and just said, hey, listen, God has done some things through us, but there's work to do. We could call that a vision service and we'll do it next week. How's that? Because we have to be careful. I believe that the church at Sardis was established as a good church and then they became weak. I think that we need to watch out for that. So the thing about the church at Sardis here is they're not being persecuted. So the church at Smyrna uh, didn't really have criticism, but they had hardships. I mean, they really had difficulties and they were being persecuted. But Sardis, here it is. This is a church that's not really being faithful and they're not being attacked, right? Because, well, it was because of their apathy. The old devil wasn't attacking them because he already had them. When the church gets this way, it demands change. We cannot allow ourselves to be apathetic, to be so just complacent. God says he will come like a thief. Jesus is saying, I will come like a thief. Now, this isn't the second coming. This isn't that thief in the knife. This is an, an abrupt stop to whatever blessings they may have as a church. So the second coming should never scare the church. We look forward to it. The Bible literally says for those who love his appearing, there is a, there's a crown for those. So we should be excited about the second coming. This is not that. This is Jesus saying that, listen, straighten up or I will completely remove my hand from you. You will not know my presence as a church. That is scary. That is judgment that the righteous judge has the right to judge at any time he wants to. The church in Sardis was in danger. I think this is the same kind of danger that the church probably has faced for the last 2,000 years at different times. Maybe different congregations, maybe different whole groups, maybe whole countries full of Christians. So the question is kind of being begged here is, where are we? So let's look at a few of these symbols here. 
white clothes, the book of life, and named. What does all that mean? So white clothes represents the righteousness of Christ. So people can, people stretch a lot of things out of about the white clothes, but really what we see here is something that's undefiled, and that's only Jesus, right? He is the righteous one. Again, this is a comparison here, a, really a contrast between his righteousness and ours. So our self-righteousness is like dirty rags, but his righteousness is pure and holy and clean. And, and so the idea there is white clothes, and that's given to the followers of Christ. Again, not self-righteousness, but the imputed righteousness of Christ that we receive because he was perfect and his sacrifice covers our sin. So we receive that. And then there's the book of life. Okay, just let you know, we're gonna, that's coming some more. There's more in-depth book of life stuff coming today. We'll just kind of touch on it because it's kind of touched on here. But it represents Jesus as the author and finisher of our faith. He writes down the names and no one can remove those names. So what we see here is his sovereignty, that Jesus is the one that writes down the names. I didn't write my name in the Lamb's book of life. He did it. It's a good thing. It's not disappearing ink. It's clear, it's legible, he wrote it, and he knows it. Ultimately, what we need to gather here is that Jesus acknowledges believers. He writes down the names. He says he knows us. He knows us. You know why this is big? Because what we do is we come together as a church and we assemble like this and we know, and we're gonna talk about this next week even more about the power that the Holy Spirit has through us as a church and the things that he'll do for us as believers when we come together and encourage one another, but also the impact that we can have in the community and the Holy Spirit uses us to work in the community, to bring others to Christ, to help those that are suffering. Great things, but there is sometimes we can get so involved in the community that we forget about the intimacy of the Holy Spirit and God in our lives. He knows us, right? He knows our church. No, he knows his bride. He knows our church. He knows you. He knows your name. It's, it, it's not like a doctor wrote it in there, like on a prescription. He wrote it himself. He can see it. He knows you. He knows your name. If you are a follower of Christ, he knows you and you can speak to him. And he wanted them to know that. Listen, he says, straighten up and repent. I know you. I know the church and I know each one of you. This is important for us to know that God knows us, not just because we're a part of something, but because we are somebody. God knows you. So this living our faith is what we need to do in the day-to-day -day grind. The Bible says, because we have given this righteousness, we should have righteous living. Now, it doesn't mean we're perfect, right? But we don't just live out our faith on the weekends. I showed up, I gave, I worshiped, I sang. But worship isn't just singing. Worship is what we do when we wake up, when we make that choice to step out of bed, to live a life. To, maybe it's on Sunday just to show up, right? But maybe it's on Monday in the way that I'm going to communicate with other people. It's about how we work, how we treat others and how we live our lives in a way that honors God. Faith isn't perfect because we're not perfect, but we're working through that. But, but faith is always on the clock. We should be living for Christ in a way that honors him always. Confession time. So this past week was a good week. Two weeks ago, not so good for me. I had a situation where I got a phone call and I was talking with someone and, I, and, and, and there was a situation where someone that I loved was being hurt and, and, and there was not justice being done. And it made me mad. I was getting riled up. I'm sitting at home. I can't do anything from where I am. Text messages aren't gonna fix it. And I decide I gotta go. It's an hour and a half drive, I'm going. So my family were sitting around the table and I said, hey, I've gotta go. And they're like, yeah, okay, we understand you gotta go. And so I'm like, I'm just gonna go. So I stand up to leave and my wife, who's wise, can see that I'm upset. And I was like, well, I'm hoping I can cool off enough in the next hour and a half that I don't say something I shouldn't say. And she, she, I literally had on an experienced community church shirt. And she goes, do you think you should change shirts before you go? <laughs> Wisdom. And I, and I said, no, 
no, I'm, I'm gonna pray for the next, I'm, I'm hoping for the next hour and a half. And this shirt may be the only thing that keeps me from saying what I don't wanna say. Because I know that I represent, if I'm gonna wear the shirt, I better live the life. And so I kept on my shirt. And I want you to know that for the next hour and a half, I prayed. Someone uh, after the first service came up and said, you know what, what did you pray? How did that help you? So, so you'll know, it's not a secret. Someone told me this many years ago. I didn't pray to be calm. I confessed sin for an hour and a half. And it's something about confessing sin that helps you embrace grace and share it with others. I was a different person when I got there than I was the hour and a half before that. And things worked out. I didn't shame the name of Christ. I didn't embarrass our congregation with my shirt. I didn't say things I didn't really wanna say. It's always on the clock. We're always living for Christ. It's not just a weekend thing. I go to church. Oh, good. That's good. I'm good you give God an hour and a half of your week. I live for Christ. And that means every day. And we're not perfect, but we're still living for him. We've got to remember that. Sardis forgot it. Let's see Philadelphia. Oh, this is one where you like this one, right? <clears throat> Write to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. Thus says the Holy One, the true one, the one who has the key of David, who opens and no one will close, who closes and no one opens. I know your works. Look, I've placed before you an open door that no one can close because you have but little power, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Note this, I will make those from the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews and are not, but are lying, I will make them come and bow down at your feet and they will know that I have loved you. Because you have kept my command to endure, I will also keep you from the hour of testing that is going to come on the whole world to test those who live on the earth. I'm coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one takes your crown. The one who conquers, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God and he will never go out again. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. Let anyone who has ears to hear, listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. So the one who has the key of David, now this is a reference to Isaiah twenty-two, twenty-two. If you'll go back and read that, you'll see some of the almost identical terminology or the identical phrasing. And it relates to Jesus telling the church in Philadelphia that they serve a God who opens and shuts doors, that God is in control. So this congregation was small and they had a lot of oppression, a lot of persecution, and they, they really should have been overwhelmed, but they were not. They stayed strong and they had strength. Why? Because God had given them strength. They kept close to Christ. The reality is this, that any obstacle can be overcome through him. We may feel weak, but he is strong. It's a good little children's song, but the doctrine and the theology is sound. I am weak, but he is strong. And that's powerful. Paul says it over and over again. In my weakness, he's glorified. I embrace my weakness because it, it doesn't lead to sin. My weakness leads to his power being seen through me and he gets the glory for it. This is what's happening in the church in Philadelphia. They seemed like a weak little church, but they stood strong and everyone knew it. It was God that was giving them the strength. It was Christ. So he looked at them that way. So he approves. He says that, listen, I've placed a door in front of you that no one can close because of your faithfulness to the word and, the, and in the middle of all this severe persecution. Now, some think that, uh, that that is their good works, that the door is open for them to continue the good works. Um, and it's because of their good works that they'll be able to continue that. I'm not saying that's a wrong interpretation. That's one um, popular interpretation. Uh, an even more popular one is that this is referring to their salvation and the door of heaven, that that is open, that no one can close that. So I'll probably take that direction, but again, either one is okay. We're not so far divergent there. Uh, good points either way, right? So, but let's look at the synagogue of Satan. Again, here we go. Uh, we see that there are members of the Jewish synagogue and he says, they're not really Jews. What he's saying is they're calling themselves Jews or even believers. He goes, but I don't even know them. 
they, they're saying that they know the Father. They don't even know the Father. And they're causing some pretty serious trouble for these local Christians. This may also be that same group in that synagogue of Satan. Um, some of those false prophets, false teachers may have come out of there. That's a possibility too. Paul talked about those a lot. So similar to Smyrna here, there's no accusation against Philadelphia, but they suffer some pretty heavy persecution. Here we're reminded again that even though I go to church, even though I give my tithe, even though I'm, I'm serving, even though I do all the right things, I'm studying God's word, I'm in a life group, people are praying for me, and I'm still experiencing times of great grief and sorrow. I'm still being attacked. My family still gets sick. I'm still having to go to the hospital. I'm, I still got the diagnosis. Allegiance to Christ is not an escape from hard times. Well, the only reason I got sick is because I didn't have enough faith. And you got sick because there was original sin. Don't blame that on God. Don't blame that on God. The, the, well, I, I guess I just didn't have enough faith. That's why I wasn't healed. Don't blame that on God. We don't escape hard times. We don't escape suffering and trials. We don't. The promise here isn't that we will escape that. The promise here is that God will be with us. That's better. That's better. It rains on the just and the unjust. It just sometimes God gives me an umbrella. And so here he, he says back, he says, you know, listen, you've endured. And so he promises that he's gonna have a door uh, that's gonna be open that no one can close and that the Jews are gonna bow down at their feet. What does that mean? And that he's gonna keep them from an hour of testing. So the door refers to salvation. That's the direction I'm going to go here is that that is a salvation that is from God that can't be taken away because it is from God because he's a sovereign God. And then bowing down at their feet probably refers back to Philippians 2, 10 to 11, where it says that every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of, of God. And so every knee will bow. Now that is specifically talking about they will bow and to the, to the name of Jesus and recognize and declare that he is the Messiah. He is the son of God, that he is God. And every knee. So up until that point, up until this time of judgment, um, and so what we see here is not that they will bow to us, right, as believers, as followers, or at this church at Philadelphia. It's that they will bow to Jesus, and we will be at his feet, and we will be with him. And so they will be bowing in front of us. Now, this doesn't mean that they will receive salvation. It just means that there will be a time when even unbelievers, and it will be after their time, after their opportunity to follow Christ, Eventually, there is coming a time where every tongue will confess that he is Lord. So he's sharing here a little bit about judgment. So he's going to keep them from the hour of testing. Oh, that's where it gets fun. It's the first reference in Revelation about the great tribulation that God's going to start, right? So Jesus promises that the church, this particular church at very least, is not gonna suffer through this awful time. Now, again, he's talking to one church here and saying that. He doesn't say all that to the other churches, right? I think a lot of times we like to pick it out and say, whoa, he must be talking to us. So this is where people start to disagree, okay? Does this passage mean, does this support the idea that there is a rapture that happens before tribulation? Or is he saying that he's going to protect them from his wrath? Okay. Here we go. We're going to disagree without dogma. Honestly, verse 10 really doesn't settle the question of the rapture in relation to the tribulation. Whether you're pre-trib, that means that you believe that there'll be a rapture before the tribulation, right? And if you're mid-trib, if you believe that there is a seven-year tribulation, mid-tribbers tend to believe that in the middle of that, some, sometimes say about three and a half years, there'll be a rapture during that time. And then there's a post-trib theory that says, well, after the tribulation, the church will go through it, but God will protect them, and they will go through the tribulation, and at his second coming, there will be a rapture at the second coming. It's all at the same time. So that's a post-trib theory. 
But whichever one of those that's been your position, or maybe you're, you know, you're balancing, juggling some of these uh, different theories. And, and that's, I'm going to say that's all fine. Let's work through that. Let's have those conversations. Go ahead and do your study uh, and have conversation about those things. But let's make sure that we are not going to get so dogmatic about a timing of something that, because that's not the critical issue here. It's not about physical protection from trials, not earthly trials for sure. I mean, we have enough persecution and trials right now. Yeah, let me just go ahead and tell you. If we are looking at this and we're saying, you know what though, um, I like the idea of the church not going through the tribulation, so I'm choosing rapture pre-trib. I'm choosing that one. Well, wouldn't we all choose that one? I mean, if, if it was up to us, God, I'm going to go ahead and put in my order. I'm going to go with that pre-trib thing. I'm going to, that's the one I'm going for. I've got enough stuff already. I, I understand that's going to be bad. We're going to read about some of that stuff. It's going to be really bad. I want to miss that. Listen, folks, we will have the persecution that we have in our lives. And it will be for us to grow us and change us and help us glorify God. Whatever that is, whatever trials we're going to have, God will use them to see himself be glorified. That's not the point. The point here is this. This is where we agree. The most important thing is spiritual protection from eternal wrath. Eternity is on the line here, not seven years, not even a thousand years. Eternity is on the line. We need to agree on the most important thing. How do we get protection from eternal wrath? We follow Christ. And then we have protection now through whatever tribulation we have, and forever. Most important thing, let's agree on that. We'll discuss and maybe disagree about timing, but let's agree on the most important thing. He says, hold on to what you have. He tells Philadelphia, just stay strong. No one's gonna take your crown. Stay strong. And he says, God's gonna make a pillar for them in heaven. This symbolizes security and permanency with God forever. So much of God's word where he reveals his sovereignty, where he says, I have the power, you are safe. I am the one that started this. I will end this. It's always been me in control. And we fight that our whole lives to get a little bit of control. And then we disagree with God. When things get hard, oh God, I don't know why you're doing this. Are you sure? <laughs> that your plan is good. That was me asking God. And then here at the end, we get this little glimpse uh, of eternity and he mentions a city descending down for us. And he just kind of mentions it there. So that's all I'm gonna do here because we're gonna get a whole lot more of that and we have some time constraints. So when that time comes and we talk more about this new Jerusalem, this city, we will dive into that even more. But that's not right here, right? He just gives a little glimpse of it. We'll just enjoy that and chew on a little bit and be ready. You gotta keep showing up, folks. Don't, don't stop coming. Don't stop coming, because there's more stuff coming. Let's look at Laodicea, this self-righteous church. Write to the angel of the city in Laodicea. Thus says the amen, the faithful and true witness, the originator of God's creation. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. For you say, I'm rich. I've become wealthy and need nothing. And you don't realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined in fire so that you may be rich, white clothes so that you may be dressed and your shameful nakedness not be exposed, and ointment to spread on your eyes so that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be zealous and repent. See, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. To the one who conquers, I will give him the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Let anyone who has ears to hear, listen to what the spirit says to the churches. Faithful and true witness. He introduces himself a little differently here than he does to the other churches. He's saying, listen, I am the true witness, the creator. Why? Because this church was having some trouble with being trustworthy. 
One of Revelation's most famous quotes right here, people love this one, this passage, and it's really very misunderstood about this church being hot or cold, uh, instead of being hot or cold, being lukewarm. So the error that comes there is that this is just, there's no compliment to the layout of sins, really. And they're saying that they're not hot or cold, but lukewarm. This temperature does not refer to their spiritual, uh, you know, their, their being on fire, right? It's not about, oh, if they're on fire for Christ and they're hot, right? If they're cold, that means they're doing nothing. Um, it's a cool illustration, but it's incorrect, right? Um, I was taught that way. I have literally taught that. Right? But I was taught incorrectly until I read it myself. And it just takes a little bit of study or really just someone with, with the proper insight. And then you can check that out and verify. And you find out that Laodicea, that this is geographical. Uh, they were in an area between this very medicinal hot springs from Heropolis. And so hot springs with all the minerals and everything was really great because people could go and bathe in that. And even it was restorative. You know, a lot of times there were, there were some healings that would happen because of the minerals that were in the water and the heat of the water. And the same thing was true in Colossus. There were these very cold, pure springs that you could drink from, and it was very cold, but very pure, and it was good for the body. So there were two things there that were good. The problem was that these streams converged, and where they converged, this hot mineral water mixed with this cold, pure water, and it corrupted the cold water, but it cooled the hot water so that it was unfit to drink. So what's the illustration here? Think coffee. Okay, coffee is great hot and it's great iced. But folks, when you leave it and let it get to room temperature, that's just wrong. You should never do that. You should drink coffee. Don't let it sit there and get lukewarm. And Jesus is saying that. This is what was happening in Laodicea. It would just sat there too long and did nothing. There's no neutral with Jesus. We're either progressing or regressing. Well, I don't know, man, that's a pretty bold statement. I didn't say it. I repeated it. Anyone who is not with me is against me. Anyone who does not gather with me scatters. That's Jesus. He's the one that said it. So we've got to make some decisions here. In our lives personally and as a church, are we moving forward? And are we growing? Are we maturing are we doing the things and being a part of the things that God would have in our lives, for our lives, for us to glorify him even more? We have decisions to make. The church at Laodicea had a decision to make. Pretty graphic here. This is how Jesus feels about apathetic Christians. When I read that, I heard a few of you go, ugh. I, I've tried to not even repeat the word because it kind of makes me, ugh. How much worse is that for Jesus to look at a church that has become so apathetic, so self-righteous that has said, you know what? We're doing great. So it happens in churches, but it happens in individuals too because you know we go through pain, we go through some suffering, we have some confusion, but then God works and he gives us peace. And then once we get peace, and then we say, whoo, I did it. I did it. I hung in there. I had the endurance. And now look who I am. This is what the church had done. And now, because I did it and I have the experience, I won't have any more problems. I won't have any more issues because I have arrived. I don't need anything else. And Jesus looked at them as he may look at us and say, don't you realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked? We don't appreciate that kind of talk. That's pretty accusatory. Don't miss the point here. This isn't about arriving financially. This is about an attitude that we can have, that anyone can have, that any church member, any follower, any church can, can grow to this point somehow. And, and we can become quick to point our fingers at others and say, well, there's the problem right over there. It, Again, I'm telling you this again. I've, I've said this before. It's that attitude like we're the best church in the city. This is the best church. I do not ever want to be called the best church. There is no competition. I want to be a good church. 
much like our brothers and sisters down the road at another good church. People say, oh, I go to, I said, hey, I know your church. That's a good church. The problem is when we start thinking that we're the best, somehow we've figured that we have it figured out, that we have accomplished. And we've been sold a lie that we're perfect or that we're the best just the way we are. And we can just follow our hearts because we've got it all figured out. Listen, there's nothing good in us apart from God. So that's where the good comes from. Let's be a good church. I don't hesitate to look at people and say, you're a good man. You're a good woman. Not because they've done great things, but because they're surrendered to Christ. And you see people like that and you know it. Let us be people like that. Let it be the righteousness of Christ and we can stay away from our self-righteousness. Then he says, buy things that you don't think you need. He has advice for them is like, you buy some gold refined in fire. Those struggles, those trials that you've been avoiding because you think that you no longer need them, stop it. You're gonna go through some stuff. So you put your love into material things. It's not about that. Invest in real things that withstand the heat of life. And then he says, cover your shameful nakedness. Just stop doing unrighteous acts. Once we, the church, can get to a point where we think that we look good to the community, Sardis, and we become so self-righteous because we think that we really have arrived and we have all the peace, Laodicea, and then our sins become secrets and we hide them. He says to me, you look like you're walking around naked. We should be embarrassed. It's fairly ironic here that this layout of Cedar was a, a place that was known for some salve that they could produce because of some of their resources there that was the best eye salve at that time in the world. They were known regionally, maybe globally, maybe everyone knew that you, if you had eye problems or eye issues, Laodicea was your chance to maybe get some healing and some eye health. And then he says, and you guys can't even see, you're blind. There's another ointment that I want to give, and it's the Holy Spirit. Seeing with some spiritual eyes. That means they were gonna have to, well, make some confessions about themselves, to themselves and others. It's something here I think we just can't miss. This means everything to me. This church had become self-righteous and they were undeserving and they get some pretty kind feelings. We need to hear this. Jesus rebukes this church really strongly, even all the churches, but he clarifies, he says, as many as I love, I rebuke and discipline. See, too many times we get this idea that when God corrects us and, and we have discipline or we have correction, we think it's punishment. Let's just think for a moment. Let's just work through this rather logically, okay? If, if a criminal breaks the law and it is bad, they get sent to prison, locked behind bars. That's punishment, that's not discipline and not the correctional facilities. It's punishment facilities. Listen, when I grew up, I broke my parents' laws plenty. I broke them a lot. And if you want to hear about it, come tomorrow night, next class. Come on, we'll eat some pizza, and I'll tell you about some of that, okay? I broke a lot of laws in my house. And for that, I received a lot of discipline. My parents never locked me in a cage. I used to think that it was punishment. That's because I didn't understand. But I grew up and I realized my parents loved me. They loved me more than the terrible things I did. They, they loved me enough to discipline me, to correct me and to hang in there with me. And so when I hear that a God loves me and corrects me, I understand that. A good father disciplines his children because he knows what's best for them. My parents in a lot of ways saved me from a lot of trouble because of the discipline that I received. God's still doing that with me. He's still doing that with us. We need to be okay with the discipline that he gives. He says, be zealous and repent. He goes, turn away from your self-righteousness, turn away from the apathy. And he says, I stand at the door and knock. I'm giving you another opportunity to answer here 
I will be with you, I will eat with you. Listen, if we will humble ourselves and rely on him for what we truly need, we will sit with God on his throne. That's him saying that. Jesus said, you'll sit with me just like I sat with my father. But there's a faithfulness that will have to happen. So let's look real quick where the rubber meets the road here. These are hard questions. If we're gonna look at the churches, these seven churches and not try to cherry pick and realize that this is us. This is Jesus writing letters to us. We have some of these great things, but we got some of these terrible things. And are we honest people? Is what you see what you get? Is, is who I am who I am? Is this the same guy that I will be in 20 minutes, an hour, two days from now? Have we become the most skilled mask wearers in our culture? I think the culture thinks we are. So are we Christian in name only? And if that's the truth, what are we doing to change it? If, if that question is coming up and we're starting to feel that conviction, like, wait, wait, is, am I real? What do we do? What are we doing to change it if we're feeling that? Do our actions speak louder than our labels? Because if you're gonna wear the shirt, it better be a reflection of your life, not of some graphic design that a creative team had. We might have to change. And we might have to change from being warm and comfortable and distracted. One of the biggest obstacles of the church could be the very things that bring us comfort and distract us from being what we could be if we'll focus on him. We can be distracted by what we call peace. <laughs> I just wanna keep it at this level. I've gotten very comfortable. I'm finally in a good place. And this is where I wanna stay. Whatever it takes to keep the status quo, because this is good. So much that we would, no God, I don't want another thing. And God says, you need another thing because you've forgotten how much you need me. Humility and understanding that we depend on something greater than us is the linchpin to this whole thing. For every one of these churches that were criticized, they'd all turn their eyes, their face, their mission away from Christ. And if you look at the ones that were faithful in following, they had one thing, humility and commitment to follow Christ. I don't know. I don't know if God is really speaking to me. You know what? I prayed at the beginning that God would speak to us, to every believer in our city. Vance Habner said this, there is a big question. There is a big question. And the big question today is not, is God speaking? It's not. How can you say that? How do we know well, let me just read something that was at the end of every one of these little letters to the churches. Let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. The Spirit is speaking to the church. The Spirit is speaking to you, to me. The Spirit is speaking. God is speaking. So that's not the big question. The really big question is this. Are we listening? And what will we do next? God hadn't stopped speaking. He's speaking today. He'll speak tomorrow. Are we listening and who will we be? We don't get to cherry pick one of these churches. We are these churches. And we need to let God deal with the challenges and the issues that we have. And that only happens when we humbly surrender and say, we have weaknesses. We're not hiding it from each other. We're not hiding it from God. So God use us and be glorified here. Let's pray.